Okay, welcome everyone to the Library of Congress Young Reader Center. My name is Sasha, I'm a program specialist here, and I work here with my colleague Monica to bring programs to kids and help you connect with the kinds of materials that we have here in the Library of Congress and things that are interesting and relevant to you. And today is really special because it's the day after Walt Whitman's 200th birthday. And we are really excited to celebrate this here with our special guests and with you guys here. Uh, we have really wonderful collections about America's, one of the most famous poets in America's history, Walt Whitman. And we're going to learn a little bit more about him. And if you want to see what kind of collection items we have for Walt Whitman, you can visit the online exhibit and uh, research guide. And the link to that is guides.lsc.gov slash Walt Whitman. And there's also information um, online about that. And you can also come visit us on Monday and see some really rare artifacts like letters and handwritten drafts and things like that. Uh, so Whitman was a really famous poet. And he was really famous for writing, but also learning all the time. And we might know that he wasn't always right. And he might have said some things that we don't agree with now. But we just wanted to kind of start off by celebrating the fact that he was always learning and he was always trying to figure out the world around him. He was trying to understand how to be a better human and I think that we can all connect with that and we can take that message with us even beyond this birthday celebration. So today we have two really special guests to help us celebrate this day. We have author Bob Burley and we have illustrator Sterling Hundley, and they're here to talk about their book, Oh Captain, My Captain, Walt Whitman, Abraham Lincoln, and the Civil War. And this was a book published this year by Abrams, and there's a copy right there. And we have asked our author and illustrator to sign the book so you can pick them up at the gift shop after the program. Uh, so quick intro, um, Bob Burley was born in Chicago, and he's been writing for 35 years. He created more than 40 children's books. He writes many kinds of stories like survival and biographies and adventures, sports, science, poetry. I don't know what you're not interested in. <laughs> and the common thread of those stories is that they're really interesting and they're full of hard facts, but also the intensity of the moment. So you can really feel what it was like to be in that moment in history. Um, so we are going to feel right in the thick of the story of Civil War right today. And Sterling is from Roanoke, Virginia. He is uh, on this coast, a painter, illustrator, designer. He's worked for Marvel and Major League Baseball and Washington Post. And by worked for, I mean he created some wonderful artwork with them. He's received many awards and is considered one of the best illustrators in the field. Yes, very cool. And he has done some really cool things like illustrate one of the classics our favorite, uh, Treasure Island, so you can see his work all around. Other than being an illustrator and painter, he's also a professor in Virginia Commonwealth University, and he's an innovator, and he brings together communities of people who like to create together. So that is all I want to say to prepare you guys to be excited about this program, and we are going to ask you guys to take it away. Thank you very much. I'm Bob Burley, and um, I'm very, very happy to be here on this special day. I've loved Whitman for as long as I can remember writing, and that not be that long, but it's back there already. And um, I'm just very happy to be able to write a book about him, and uh, this is what I'm going to read from. But I'd also, in passing, just like to uh, pass on some thanks to the book publisher, which is Abrams. Uh, the, my editor, Howard Reeves, uh, the Library of Congress, of course, for having us, and Sterling Hundley for being the excellent illustrator that he is. We just met this morning. I already love the guy, and I love his, and I already loved his work, so I'm very happy to be here. And I'm going to, um, the book that we've published uh, uh, right now is not a full-scale biography of Walt that is a birth to death. Um, uh, he had a very special, um, what should I say, relationship to the country, as you well know, and to Abraham Lincoln, as he got to know him. He didn't know him personally, they never met, but he loved him just the same. And uh, I was so happy when somebody like, proposed this book to Abrams, and 
It started out to be only a book on uh, Whitman, but then the editor said, hey, let's add Abraham Lincoln. And I'm saying, thinking, that's only, a, what's that, another 500 pages of reading? I have to do that, what do we do here? But anyway, I was very happy to do that. This is, um, so this is a, I'm gonna read from the book, which we call, Oh Captain, My Captain, and it's called that because it's really a, a trying to sort of relate Whitman to Lincoln. Uh, by the way, they never met each other. Uh, Walt was a, uh, saw him around Washington. Okay, and um, I'll, just, I'll just start reading here, okay? And each one of my little page segments starts out with a quote from Whitman. Okay, so that's, I am the man I suffered, I was there. The bearded man in the entryway softly closes the door behind him. He pauses. Standing perfectly still for a moment, he lets his eyes grow accustomed to the flickering light. Lamps hanging from the walls cast a pale glow over a long room lined with cots, many containing a wounded soldier. The man hears the sound of breathing, the rustle of a, the rustle of a body somewhere <coughs> in bed. The big room, the gloom, the stench of sickness. Is this makeshift shed really a hospital? Suddenly, the stillness is pierced by a single sharp cry of pain. Oh, oh, oh. Is it coming from here? Is it coming from over there? The man in the doorway steps lightly across the creaking floorboards. The wounded soldier, so young, a boy nearly, stares straight up with fixed, wide open eyes. A stain of wet blood seeps into a crumpled bandage around one shoulder. The man tries with careful fingers to straighten the bandage. The boy's pained, frozen gaze unlocks. He stares into the bearded face above him. Who are you, he seems to ask. For a moment, the man says nothing. He holds the soldier's hand firmly in his own warm hand. Then he speaks. Hello, I am Walt. I am Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman, is this Walt Whitman the poet? What is a poet doing here in the foul-smelling gloom of a Civil War hospital? Among the wounded, the dying, and the dead. One answer to that question comes from Walt Whitman himself. I'm not going to read the whole book, but I'm going to read several pages. Okay. And again, the quote at the top says, I am large, I contain multitudes. These are taken from poems, letters, and so on. He called himself Walt Whitman, an American, one of the roughs, a cosmos, Sometimes he was a poet, other times he was a nurse, a comrade, or a journalist. And finally, he was the mourner in chief for the nation's greatest president. Could any <coughs> person be all these things and more? Yes, for Walt had a generous soul and a large ambition, large enough to become America's first great poet. I stick these three lines from the one of his poems, an early poem. I celebrate myself and sing myself and what I assume you shall assume, for every atom belonging to me is good belongs to you. That's from the song of myself. Large enough, still talking about Walt, large enough to praise both the tiny and the immense. I believe a leaf of grass is no less than the journey work of the stars. Large enough to include all people in this vision. I am of old and young. I am the poet of the woman, the same as the man large enough to identify with the most mistreated persons. I am the hounded slave. I wince at the bite of the dogs. As Walt himself said, he contained multitudes, and he meant it. Okay, um, I'm not gonna read this entirely, but uh, Walt kind of predicted, <coughs> this is very interesting to me, in the last decade before the Civil War, when there was a lot of <clears throat> tension between the northern and southern states and so forth and so on. And besides that, the government of the United States looked to Walt and many other people as being sort of weak and crumbling. In the late 1850s, America's special promise to achieve freedom and equality for all, its very democracy seemed to Walt dangerously at risk. For several years, he felt a dark cloud had been gathering over the land. Slavery, corruption, bribery, greed, democracy, scorn. 
Could anyone help reverse this impending storm? Walt believed so. Several years before the election of 1860, listen to this, he imagined that such a person so needed would indeed arrive. Walt wrote that his new hoped for leader would be some, quote, healthy body, beard faced American. He would arrive out of the real West and the log hut. Walt imagined that this new president would be both shrewd and heroic. You've never heard of Lincoln this time, of course. Now, northern abolitionists and industrialists faced southern plantation slave owners. The ship was foundering and needed a captain, and the captain did soon appear, his name Abraham Lincoln. So the book sets up the contrast, not the contrast, but at least the fact that Whitman was already visiting the hospitals and um, soon would he never met uh, Lincoln, but he did know him. Okay. From his first sighting of Abraham Lincoln, the man in the White House was never far from Whitman's thoughts. Lincoln is particularly my man, and by the same token, I am Lincoln's man, he says. We are afloat in the same stream. We are rooted in the same ground. What drew the poet to the president? Walt loved the fact that Lincoln, like Walt himself, came from the common people those lacking formal education, social status, and wealth. It confirmed Walt's belief, Walt's belief in the average person's potential for greatness. But there was more. Both men had an almost mystical faith in the union and in democracy. Walt's poetry arose in part from his vision of America, and much of Lincoln's political thought rested on the United States Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. I'm doing jumping here, so there's a lot of uh, connections that I think exist that will not exist here. Okay. Okay. America brought to hospitals in her fair youth. That's a quote from Walt again. We'll leave in the end. The war now has started, and by the way, the war, 700,000 people and soldiers died in the Civil War, and the hospital, so-called, will be mentioned here, is nothing like you might get today if you have a, a bit of a sore throat and you run down to some major hospital. If we're talking about a room about this size with bed, beds all over, except it's a lot dirtier, messier, and so on. And they were all over, scattered all over uh, the city of Washington in particular. I'm not sure if the South must have had the same thing, and I don't know what city it really said it out. But anyway, this is America brought to her hospital in her fair youth is what Whitman began to see, to see <clears throat> because he started to visit the hospitals. Walt began to learn more about the hospitals scattered throughout Washington. Converted warehouses, government buildings, newly constructed sheds, large private houses, wherever enough beds could be placed. To him, the hospitals <clears throat> almost came to stand for the war itself. The expression of American personality is not to be looked for in the great campaign in the battle flights, he said. It is to be looked for in the hospitals among the wounded. It's a quote from Walt. So he began to visit hospitals. He had a little job in the morning, this is Walt uh, Whitman, a little government job in the afternoon and evenings he was free. When he left his government job in the morning, he would stop by some hospitals and he'd go at night and, stop and, and visit hospitals, okay, in D.C. What I give, I give out of myself. In his long poem, Song of Myself, Walt had proclaimed, I am the man, I suffered, I was there. Now these words would be put to the test. The sick, the wounded, the disfigured, the despairing, and the dying called out to him, and he answered. A large, glowing, gray-bearded man, strangers would sometimes say he resembled a retired sea captain. Walt, Walt believed a friendly, magnetic personality could sometimes do as much as medicine to heal a wounded man. The smallest things mattered, how he spoke, his handshake, his smile, how he was dressed. Often he wore a necktie, sometimes he even put a flower in his buttonhole. Quote, you can imagine, he wrote, his, he wrote home to his mother, 
I cut quite a swell, unquote. Walt wasn't picky. He took on any role he thought would help. Friend, listener, assistant, nurse, secretary, delivery man, brother, father, or even mother. Okay. His days now, where? I'm going to skip that paragraph. Often, Walt would make air afternoon hospital stops, then returning to his small bare room for dinner. He would eat a meager meal. His dinner plate was simply a piece of brown paper that he crumpled and tossed into the fire after the meal was over. Before heading out again to the hospitals, he would check one of his handmade notebooks, little notebooks he kept. Not much of a notebook, just folded paper pinned together, sometimes stained with blood, in which he had listed the wounded soldier's requests. He then would rifle through his supplies, stuffing gifts into a large knapsack. Such simple needs. Bed 23, that's why you would kind of remember what, what where, a piece of houndstooth candy, Bed 30, paper and pencil. Bed 71, an orange, an orange. Bed 77, a handful of change. Bed 98, a Bible. Taking a small store of money, he had very little and spent nearly all of it on presents for the soldiers. He might stop at a market for fruit, a stationery shop for envelopes, or a bakery for, for biscuits, cookies, and other sweets. Then he would walk to the hospitals. I sort of left Lincoln out of here. We talk about him earlier in the book. Uh, Walt would see him occasionally, and he was sort of inspired by the fact that he felt Lincoln was suffering and fighting this war with a lot of opposition coming from both North and South. And so he, he knew that uh, Lincoln would pass on Friday nights. Lincoln would go out to a little place to stop and uh, sleep at the overnight at least in the warmer weather, away from the White House. And uh, Walt would sort of time his reach. His, you know, a would be coming in a state uh, carriage, of course. Um, and Walt's way to the hospital in the late afternoon, he often would walk to a corner where he knew the president's carriage would pass by. Did Lincoln ever take note of the stranger who stood there watching? Once, standing and waiting, Walt heard the sounds of turning wheels and horses' hooves. The carriage carrying Abraham Lincoln slowly came into view, followed by a company of cavalry with such sabers drawn and held high. Walt, his knapsack slung over his shoulder, leaned forward. The carriage clattered past. The president looked down at Walt. Who is this? Walt Whitman gazed back at the president. Their eyes met. Abraham Lincoln seemed to nod. Walt nodded in return. Moving on, the carriage rounded a corner as Walt watched it disappear. Simply to see this president, to catch a glimpse of his face, increasingly etched to suffering, so awful ugly, as I quote, quote, so awful ugly it becomes beautiful, unquote, like that. Yet with a dry smile on occasion, was uplifting. Just to watch as the stiff figure sitting motionless in the shadow of the carriage, of, of the shadow of the carriage passed by, gave Walt new energy. He felt Lincoln was giving his all and beyond. How could Walt do less? Oops, sorry about that. Okay. Okay. Walt, I'm still Walt in the hospital. I'm probably just going to read, let's see, a couple paragraphs from this page. My wife is my critic, so she's always like, you're going too fast, you're going too slow, you're saying too much, you're saying too much. Anyway. <laughs> like, all right. So, uh, Walt uh, tried to speak to each soldier in the wards he visited, attempting to give at least a word or a trifle to everyone. He read to the men stories, poems, and newspaper articles. He played games of cards with them or 20 questions. He helped them write letters home. Once he even bought ice, brought ice cream, a treat many of the wounded soldiers had never tasted. When called upon, he cleansed wounds and witnessed many amputations. Nearly three out of four operations during the Civil War were amputations. And I should add, once you were amputated, you were pretty much on the death list because it didn't have much cleanliness there, so they chopped your arm off. Could be curtains, okay? Um, and always through his long, difficult days, Walt kept his poet's eye, jotting down a few lines whenever he had a free moment. In one poem, The Wound Dresser, he wrote, the hurt and wounded, I pacify with soothing hand. 
I sit by the restless all the dark night. Even uh, President Lincoln also came to the hospital, but nowhere near often as well. Okay, I'm going to, this is a very touching paragraph or two to me. Adieu, dear comrade, your mission is fulfilled. That's a quote from Walt. Soldiers came and soldiers went, and then he never left alive at all. The worst moment came too often, the death watch. Walt Whitman, the poet, had earlier written, the smallest sprout shows there is really no death. Now Walt, the nurse, would sit quietly with many young soldiers as they died. Sometimes he brushed a boy's forehead with a cool cloth or held a dying soldier's hand. When the end came, there was, quote, a pause. The propping pillows are removed. The loosey head falls down. The arms are softly placed by the side. And the broad white sheet is thrown over everything. But that wasn't the end of Walt's work. He would take out his little notebook, inscribe another name and address, and prepare to write a letter to the soldier's family. As he wrote to one bereaved parent, your son was one of the thousands of our unknown American young men in the ranks, about whom there is no record or fame, but I find in them the real precious and royal ones of this land. I love that. He identified himself simply, I'm only a friend visiting the wounded and sick soldiers. Okay. Um, what happened of it, I'm, gonna be, I'm jumping along here, I know we have time. Uh, Walt actually began to get sick. He was uh, more tired and probably in the hospitals were not well, so, but he continued to go, okay. And, um, uh, and he continued to watch Lincoln, uh, and he glad the last time he saw Lincoln alive was when he attended Lincoln's second uh, inauguration in uh, 1864. It was 65, I guess it was early 65. It was almost the last time Walt Whitman would see Abraham Lincoln alive. Okay. Again, this is Walt's note. Oh, the bleeding drops of red. It was a date people at the time would remember for the rest of their lives. They would remember where they were, too, when they got the news. April 14, 1865, President Lincoln shot. April 15, 1865, President Lincoln dead. Walt sat in the kitchen of his mother's home, a uh, poorly furnished apartment in Brooklyn. He had come home for a short visit. Newspapers were scattered on the table in front of him. Neither Walt nor his mother had eaten, nor would they eat for the rest of the day. We each drank half a cup of coffee. That was all. The president was dead. Then there's several pages, which I'm not going to read, that sort of summarize the death of Lincoln and the assassination in Forest Theater in the town here, and the death, uh, which I will pass by at the moment, but it's covered here. And, uh, and I'm jumping ahead here because I wanted to sort of end this on Walt's home to Lincoln, which you know, but I'll say some of it at least. Oh, Captain, my Captain. The bearded man sits at his writing table. A notebook lies open before him. In the lamplight, his memories flicker and fade. The four years of war, the battles, the hospitals, the deaths of so many soldiers he knew me love, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And what are the pain and suffering of mothers, fathers, wives, sisters, brothers, friends, the suffering of an entire nation? His mind returns to the dead present. He seems to feel the rhythm of far off train wheels, the slow train carrying Abraham Lincoln's body across the north to Springfield, Illinois, to be buried. Walt knows that along that route, many thousands come out to stand and watch the train as it passes, some saluting, some weeping. Do they understand what the president endured during those horrible years? Somehow they do. That is why they come out to wait and watch, sun or rain, day or night. But perhaps they cannot put into words what they feel. Can Walt Whitman? The president, the man who guided the nation through the agony of a long war, is finally at rest. The captain has returned home from his awful voyage. Yes, the captain. Slowly, a few words tumble on the paper. A poem begins to take 
shape. Words are scratched out. New words take their place. Walt Whitman, the poet, stands up, walks to the window, and stares into the darkness. He feels the poem blowing in him now. He sits again, takes up his pen, pen, and begins to write. Oh, captain, my captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack. The prize is won. That's the end of the book, but there's a long back matter in which both Walt and Lincoln are sort of uh, re-biographed, <laughs> if that's the right word. Uh, there's two poems of, of Walt's, this one I started to read, the uh, Oh Captain, My Captain, which I know many of you know that poem. It's probably the only poem that I know that Walt ever wrote in rhyme, at least as an adult. And uh, I've always, we read that poem when I was in eighth grade. Graduated, the teachers always give you something to, to recite as a class, so we read that poem. And I've, ever, I've thought of it all the time, it's kind of a awkward, not that well, always had the smoothness, as you know, of, you know not always, but it has had the smoothness of unrhymed poems. Um, but reading it again, I think it might even be worth your while to read it again, because as a rhymed poem, I think it works pretty well. I was very happy to feel that year. when I began to write this. I thought, oh, that poem is a bummer. But actually, it's not Walt in his style, but it carries weight. Okay? And um, that's kind of it. <laughs> I think I've skipped over a number of things. Um, I didn't do one, one thing I wanted to do was show the wonderful, I will say this again, if I have the beautiful. This man is somebody you should treasure as an artist. I'm not just talking to my mom. I am an artist and I, I happen to know good art. And Sterling is, the, the illustrations in this book are probably, in my opinion, I've seen an awful lot of children's books, I, are just some of the best I've ever seen, both in their imaginative uh, tone, the reality of it, the feeling in them, the, the strange imaginations at times. I'm so pleased with this book. Uh, and I've always, I, I've loved Whitman since I began to try to write poetry long ago, but anybody in America who tries to write poetry has to go through Walt Whitman in a way. Doesn't mean you have to like him. A lot of people do not. There's always a discussion. But the point is, he stands there as a kind of force that you have to sort of agree with or disagree. I, I'm talking too much now. Can I stop? <laughs> I just, uh, I want to say thank you, and uh, your words are more meaningful than I can express in front of a large group like this, but um, I have a, a question to ask you all. How many of you are here for the first time? You're all regulars. I'm here for the first time. My family's here for the first time. In this room or at the Library of Just at the Library of Congress. Yeah, no. it, it's, it's, a, it's a new experience for me, and uh, just, I like to research things before I jump in. Uh, so 16 million books are housed here. Over 120 million artifacts, manuscripts. Um, these are collections of, of ideas. And if you think about it, you know, if you exclude other languages and you just simply look at English, we're talking about 26 letters, nine numbers, that are put together in a sequence in a way that try to express the, the, the range of human experience. That's really remarkable. So these words are, these letters are put together into words, these words become sentences, these sentences become stories, and we express ideas, emotions that cut across time and space. That's a pretty remarkable thing that we as human beings can do. So I'm grateful, um, first of all, for the opportunity, these words in this book that, that, that Bob wrote. I was given the manuscript and that was an opportunity from the, from the publisher Abrams. We, as Bob said, hadn't met until this morning. And we, uh, we shared parfait. It's <laughs> good too. It was good. Um, and uh, I, so I'm grateful for this relationship that's, that's building. I'm grateful for the Library of Congress, not just the opportunity, but the space. Before this was a building, before this was anything else, this was an idea. And it was an idea that was brought to life for, you know, through, through words and, and pictures and drawings and a lot of great minds coming together. And I just want to point that out, that everything that is here started off simply as an idea. 
And as I was going through Bob's story about Lincoln and Whitman, you know, you'll, you'll be hard pressed to find me without this in hand. This is my journal. And I call it a journal because it's somewhere between a sketchbook and, and a, a life story that I'm writing. And with that, you'll see that I've got a pencil. And, you know, this isn't any different, really. It's a nice pencil, I admit. But it's not that different than what Walt Whitman used. You know, graphite and wood. But the act of drawing, the act of writing, is a way for us to get things that are up here and things that are inside here out onto a page. That in itself is not necessarily an act of courage. I think it's an act of therapy where we process things. But think about what Walt Whitman was able to do with his words, to go to people who were in these harrowing, harrowing situations where they were on their last breath, and he could share words and thoughts with them that would improve their spirits. He could capture their ideas, their names, and let them know that their legacy was going to live on even beyond that moment. That's really a remarkable thing that we get to do as, as authors and, and illustrators and, and writers. And I would encourage you, if, if you don't have a journal, if you don't have a means of, of just documenting your thought and processing the world, it will be some of the best therapy you will ever go through. And who knows, it may turn into a story that lives on the shelves here in the Library of Congress one day. One thing that I wanted to bring that, that we could share in person that, that I don't think is, is often expressed through books is it's, it's, it's a labor, it's a process. It's not like Bob took these words and just threw them together and voila, we have a story. He labored for months, if not years, probably trying to figure out ways to tell the stories of these two men and how they came together at this point in time. I was given a year to work on the, on the, the pictures for this and I dove into the research, I, I worked on sketches, those went back to the art director, they came back, I worked through new ideas, new iterations, I explored thoughts about armed freedom. If you haven't looked out at the Capitol building, uh, you'll see a giant, well it looks tiny, there's a statue on the top of the Capitol, that's armed freedom, there's an entire history there that I explored that's genuinely exciting to me. So. Um, I want to make this a little bit more intimate if we can. I want you all to experience the hot lights <laughs> and the cameras. Um, I'm going to show a few things on the screen up here, but I brought uh, a bunch of the originals that I'd love for you to put your hands on and to look through and hand around. I've got the sketchbooks that show the process and the thinking that go behind that. Uh, and I've got a few other sketchbooks as well, if that doesn't break form too much for us here. So let me show, share a few things real quick before I open the floor to you all. Um, I'm also grateful that these three are here. My wife, Shelly, my son, Bryson, and my daughter, Madison. Um, also, my best friend, Patrick, I haven't seen in years. Uh, so, they, of course, yeah. I just wanted to say one thing about what you're saying, don't lose your train. I want to make mention of the fact that my wife, Jenny Roberts, over here, uh, was very, very instrumental in getting this book together. Uh, especially when they added uh, Lincoln to the story of Whitman, and I said, oh, that's too much for me. She said, no, it's not. You're going to call up and say, take it. <laughs> Which I did do. But Jenny was a very significant helper. To get Thank you. And, and this is my illustration widow over here. Every time I get into a, a project, I, yeah, I disappear and, and uh, you know, try to be the best husband and dad I can be, but it's not, I don't have much to offer during those times. So, um, so this is where it begins, and this is the, the things that I think I could share with you today that I think it's really difficult uh, for a, a child or someone who's not a, a creative. We hear a song or we read a book or we see pictures and we see the absolute best efforts of that creative, that, that author, to hide all of our mistakes, right? So we don't show the process, we show the, the, the best result of, of all of our choices and decisions. Well, th these are all the mistakes, right? So th these are, they're all, all in here. They're here for you to look through. And this was uh, the very opening spread. I contain multitudes, and you can see how that abstract concept would terrify children, probably. Um, there are a number of things in this book that could terrify children, and uh, it, it became a, a creative thing to, to, to figure out how to solve that and relay that uh, out. So um, I was going to show a few things here, but I sent the wrong link. 
Uh, you all don't want to understand how to start a freelance illustration career. So we'll pass on that, but uh, we've got other things. So come up here, put your hands on these things, take a look at them. Um, from that stage of just the initial diving into the manuscripts, and I, I'm given a, a raw uh, manuscript at that point, uh, we work through the sketches, and this probably won't show really well. Let me do this. But this is the sketch, and I think that this one was probably the, the biggest turning point for me in the book, where I took the text and I started to move into the metaphor of Abraham Lincoln as more than just the man who suffered terribly, but as the, the myth that we understand him now. So I got to play with scale and introduce a bit of magic to the storytelling, and that got me excited. Thank you. Please come up and look through these things. Um, so yeah, diving into the research, getting involved with the, the thinking, that's all drawing is for me. It's just thinking out loud. And once you move beyond that point of just drawing for yourself or writing for yourself and you choose to share it, I think that that's genuinely an act of courage because you are taking these things that are highly emotional, highly charged, highly personal, and you choose to share them with other people with the hope that someone else will relate to what you're saying. That's an incredible thing to get to do. So anyways, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. I want the pictures to speak for themselves, but come up here and look at these things. Um, of course, this is Walt Whitman, and uh, there's, there's other people who are cast in here, but um, you might not recognize, because you haven't met her, but you stand up real quick. <laughs> That's my sweet girl Madison there. So this is uh, who I use for reference down in the bottom corner. And, um, it's just one of those things that, that I want to give her some bragging rights as she goes to school, you know? So if you can advance one more there. <laughs> That's, that's my boy Bryson, and, you know, so it, it's, it is fun to kind of get yeah. to work these things in, and, you know, they're also cheap models, so, um, truth be told, go to dance there. And uh, this, is, uh, this is one, just probably one of my favorite spreads from the book, it just kind of had the right tone and, and mood, but um, I'm not sure if anyone's seen it, but I got to plant a few Easter eggs in here, so I got to hide their names, and then uh, my wife's name Shelley is also hidden within this too. So just little things like that that we, we do to take these stories and make ourselves excited about them, to make ourselves passionate about them and to share them out with other folks. And uh, there's nothing hidden or secret in this, but um, one of the things that I, I really tried to do in the stories is I tried to, I got onto everything from, from Google Maps and, and tried to explore the, the try to triangulate the information that Bob put together about which window was Lincoln's, which uh, room he would have been writing in. Turns out in the White House, this one or this one. Uh, he actually may have been writing in either one, uh, burning the midnight oil. And this, is, of course, is Whitman walking down the street. And I was trying to make sure that I, I got the, the muddy streets of that time period right and, and other information. Uh, you can advance one more. I mentioned process for those of you who haven't seen the sketches. Um, this is what the drawings look like before I, I messed them up with paint. So I, I wish I could have just left them all as drawings and uh, my dad told me to do that. And uh, you know, of course I had to take them to some level of finish. But Walt Whitman is hidden up here in the top left corner. It's a bit of a, you know, where's Waldo? And you know, so maybe Ralph Waldo Emerson would have been a better choice. But um, advance please. And the rest are just, I, I was just gonna show these just as a, a means of uh, telling the story between the lines. So one of the things that I got from uh, N.C. Wyeth that he would talk about is he never wanted to illustrate literally the story, he wanted to illustrate the scenes that happened between the lines. So if you've seen uh, the original uh, Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson, there's a scene where Jim is at the Admiral Benbow and he's leaving home. We know that he has to leave home to go on this huge adventure and his mother is in tears, she's breaking down in the background. Well that scene is never written about but it must have happened. So a lot of the story and a lot of the things that I was trying to interject was to add texture and substance to what um, Bob wrote from the historical record and his interpretation of that and just bring things to this that allowed both of us to, to write part of the, the script. So he's writing with words, I'm writing with pictures. You know. just break in, I do a little bit of that myself. For example, in that part where uh, uh, Walt looks at uh, Lincoln in the 
coach as he drives by. So I did watch from the corner, but I kind of brought them in a little closer just to sort of make it seem like there was a real connection as opposed to, you know, I see the guy way, you know, across the block. It's that kind of, so I made it seem that in the story that they're, they're as close as we are, let's say. Right. You know, where they think that it's probably more like you and somebody, that distance between them because I think you couldn't have it in the street. But I think that's kind of parallel to what you're talking well, about. Well, it, it was really interesting as I got into the research I found some excerpts that you had used as points of reference. I found some of the original sources. And what's incredible with what Bob did is there's, there's a huge amount of creativity that goes into figuring out how to tell the story, the perspective, uh, the, 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 uh, the audience in mind, trying to stitch these things together. So there's, even though we're dealing with you know, facts, we're dealing with history, there's a huge part of this narrative that is, is immensely creative in putting these things together. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I started seeing the web that you had to, to, mm -hmm. to tie together. So um, th this scene was uh, was Whitman. I, I just assumed that these terrible things that he was seeing and experiencing had to move beyond you know him just being there to, to uh, show joy and to, to take care of them. This was immensely traumatic for him as well. So I, I try to stow him away into a side room and, and the boots are there as indicators of soldiers who've passed away. They, they can't wear boots anymore. They're not there to, to wear them. Uh, so there's little things that became symbols throughout the storytelling that I really enjoyed. But all I want to say in closing uh, on my part is that uh, I, I'm, I'm grateful to have uh, this opportunity. I'm grateful to have a means by which I process and share things and I think that, that as you walk around these, these, these halls here at the Library of Congress, just remember that 26 letters, nine numbers, compile a huge amount of the record of what we understand as, as recorded thought within Western civilization. And I, I think that it's just an ama amazing thing to understand that from those very few limitations, original thought has, has been given life, has been born, and has affected all of us in significant ways that we can understand. Thank you. Thank you.